Okay, so if you're watching this video, you should already have R downloaded. So make sure that you have followed the directions very carefully on the page that comes before the basics, downloading R, the instructions for downloading R. And once you downloaded R, it should look something like this. Now this is a Windows machine that I have on the screen, on the right side of my screen. But if you have a Mac, it looks very similar. And there's a screenshot in the downloading R instructions. So once you have R open, it really doesn't tell you much, right? It only has a cursor. So you'll notice that if I hit enter, my cursor moves down to the next line. So this greater than sign, the red arrow, right pointing arrow here on the left side of the screen of the R console is called the command prompt. And that means it's waiting for you to give it a command. So it's prompting you to give it a command. Whenever you have that um, command prompt, it's ready for a new line of code. So first, let's talk about some basic functionality of R. So it can work like a fancy calculator. So the basics go over some of those basic operations. All right, so it can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponents, um, and most of the symbols look very familiar, should look very familiar to you, except for maybe that multiplication is an asterisk, um, division is a forward slash, and exponent is a caret. All right, so you can put in any kind of multiplication in here. You can say, you know, three by six, and you can hit enter, and it'll give you your answer. Now notice that there's a one in square brackets here by my answer 18. That's because at the beginning of every row of output that R gives you back, it's going to mark what the first observation is that starts that line. So if there are like 30 observations in the second line, 30 pieces of output in the second line starts with the 25th, you'd have a square bracket with a 1 on the first row and a square bracket with the 25 on the second row. All right, so the way that you're going to use these R help pages is you're just going to read what I put here. I say the following code and output demonstrate how R can be used like a calculator. Multiply 2 times 3 and print the answer. And I tell you, just put in 2 times 3. You can type it in your R console. You can also copy and paste. It has that functionality. And it gives you your answer 6. So what you're going to do is you're going to work through these pages, typing in all the lines of code that are in these kind of light gray boxes, and making sure that you got the output that I got here. All right, and 27 by 9. We can try that out. And it gave us 3. You can use parentheses just like you can in a normal calculator. Oh, another thing I want to point out real quick before we go on is that inside your R console, you can move around your windows. Right now you only have one window open, but later we'll have graphics windows and maybe some other windows open. Um, and you can resize it too. You can resize any of your windows to be the size that you want. Okay, so it's pretty flexible in that way. All right, so we're going to go down here, um, and you can you can play with this code. Um, I could freelance. I could do twenty seven divided by um, let's see um, nine plus two. You can put anything in here that you want, and it'll do the calculation for you just like a calculator. Okay, now if I have a line of code that has a hashtag, a pound sign, whatever you want to call that. Um, it's going to ignore anything after that sign as a comment. So if I run this whole stuff over here, even with that writing, it's going to ignore it and still do 27 divided by 3 plus 3 plus 3. Okay? Now, one trick that I want you to get used to right away is hit your up arrow and you can scroll through all of your previous commands. So if you just hit the right up arrow one time and get that last line of code, I'm going to just backspace and show you what happens if I don't have the pound sign in there. I'm going to just take it out. And it says error, unexpected symbol in 27 divided by 3 plus 3 yet. So notice that yet is where the error message ends. That tells you, so it, it's not, it doesn't print out another way to divide 27 by 9. That tells you that the error is probably happening right there. 
And so I would say, okay, the error is happening there. I forgot to put my pound sign in. Okay. All right. Perfect. Um, okay, so data types and structures, structures you can read about yourself, but we basically will be working with vectors a lot and a data frame. A data frame is a fancy list of lists. Um, it's, it's basically like the data that you get in an Excel spreadsheet where you can have some columns that are numerical and some that are categorical. All right. Obviously, we don't want to um, type in our data every time. That would defeat the purpose of using a heavy hitter, real deal, industrial strength software like R. We're going to want to be able to call in data sets, and we're going to be able to define objects so we can store things in R's memory and do computations on them. So notice that when I type 2 times 3 and hit enter, it just gives me 6. It didn't store that value. There's nothing more that I can do with that computation. However, if I want to define an object, I can maybe call it the letter A. I'll do the less than dash. That is your is defined as symbol. If I store that as 2 times 4 and hit enter, it didn't give me an answer, right? A lot of you are probably expecting it to give you 8. Why didn't it? Because I just stored the number 8 as A, and that's called an object in R. And to see what this object contains, you can just hit A, and it will tell you. Now, R is case sensitive, so if I type lowercase a, it's going to tell me that it can't find lowercase a. So be careful about that because it is case sensitive. All right. So let's see. Okay, you can store a data set. We'll call this one my first vector. My first, um, yeah, my first vector. And notice the way that I coded this in here, this object name. I started the first word off with a lowercase letter and every word after that with an uppercase. That's called camel case. That's a common thing to do in computer coding so that you can keep track of what you're doing. And so I'm defining my first vector be the list of numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4 separated by commas. And the way that I'm going to make them a vector is I'm going to combine them. I'm going to concatenate them with the C function. It's the lowercase c function. And hit enter. And then if I want to see what my first vector is, oops, you have to spell it right. <laughs> so I'm glad I did that actually because R is very finicky. It's not going to try to find um, an object unless it's named exactly the same as how you input it. So my first vector, it says, okay, it's 1, 2, 3, 4. It's the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. All right. Another way that you can put that same thing is in is you can just use a colon. So the same convention that you're used to in Excel, when you do 1, colon, 4, it's just going to do all the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I could take a look at VEC2, and there we go. Then you can build a sequence. You can use the sequence function. Let's go ahead and put that over here. And the sequence function, the first argument is the number you want to start with, the second one is the one you want to end with, and the third one is the step by what increments. So if I look at sequence back, I can see that it went from 1 to 10 with increments of 0.1. So that's the way sequence works. And R has many built-in functions, okay? Um, the sequence function is just one of the functions that is built in in R. There are too many to count, probably. Okay? Um, notice that this has arguments. So if I do this sequence from 2 to 10 by 2, it's going to go from 2 to 10 in increments of 2, so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. All is right and good. I can also specify what the arguments are. So if you put your arguments in order of what the help file says, you don't need to define what the arguments are. You can just put the values of them in. But I can also name them by their argument. Okay? So let's just look at this real quick. The way that you can find the arguments of a function is to use the help file. 
And to find the help file, just type in question mark and the name of the function, and it should pull up a, an internet window. And here in the help file, it tells you that the sequence function has arguments from, to, and then by. And it tells you that from equals one and two equals one. So what does that mean? So that means, I wonder if I don't have to put anything in here. Yep. So it means that the default for from and to is one and one. So it has some defaults put in here. So if you don't specify, it's going to assume that upper bound is one. All right, so back to the basics. And when you specify your arguments, you can go out of order from the way they come in that help file. So here, if I only put the numbers in, I have to put them in the from, to, by order because that's the way they're set up in the help file. But down here, if I specify the arguments, then I don't need to put them in any particular order. So that one goes from to um, 210 by two, and it does the same thing. All right. Um, and then if I wanna count backwards, I can just put a negative in there in my by. You can test that out yourself. All right, so let's talk about missing values because real life data sets aren't clean. They have missing values in them. So if I want to um, take a look at what happens when I have missing values, I can put an NA. That's R's language for not available. And if you import a CSV file, that's the ones we'll be using this semester. If you import a CSV file with, an N with a missing empty cell, R is going to code it as an NA, it's not available. And that means missing data. And real data has missing data a lot. All right, so I can look at VEC2 and see that it's the numbers 1, 2, and 3 and a missing value NA. Look what happens if I try to take the mean of VEC2. That's a built-in function to calculate the average. It's going to tell me not available. And that is because there is an NA in the VEC2 object. So what we need to do is look at the help file and you will see that to remove the NAs, there's an argument called NA.RM and you can set it to equal true. And then it will calculate the mean of the, uh, of the remaining numbers, of the numbers that actually are there. Okay. All right, also notice that you can abbreviate the arguments a lot. I don't need to spell out the whole word true. Inside the function, it's only got certain arguments that are defined. So if it's not ambiguous, you can abbreviate inside those arguments. So I'll often just put the capital T there instead of um, the whole word. And let's see if I can, I've never tried this before. Let's see if we can abbreviate the argument name. Yep. So as long as this, there's not another argument that starts with NA, it's gonna, it's gonna assume that's NA.RM equals true. All right, moving on. Um, let's see, okay. We've already done that. And then here are a list of table, uh, a table of common functions. This is not by any stretch all of the functions that are included in R, but you can read through these. It does square root, logarithm, Note that the log in R, a lot of statisticians use that notation to denote the natural logarithm that's base E. And those of you who have had uh, math courses in the past might be bothered by that. I sure was when I started out as a statistician, but just knowing the statistics literature, they often use log to denote the natural logarithm. Um, you can do E to the to a um, number, and that's the EXP function, the mean, standard deviation, variance. The length of a vector is going to give you um, how many elements are in the vector, okay, including an NA. So the mean of VEC2, I mean, the length of VEC2 over here will be 4. Okay. All right. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other ones here that you can check out, and we'll explain them as we use them this semester. Now, logical operators are what, what's at the core of pretty much every R function and calculation. 
So notice that when you're doing equal to, you're going to have to do two equal signs. Not equal to, not is always an exclamation point. So not equal to is exclamation equal. And then of course you have your less than, less than or equal, greater than, greater than or equal. This vertical bar, which on my keyboard is, I do shift and the key that's right above enter on the right. And then the and, ampersand is for and. So this vertical bar is for or, and this is for and. These you might use one day, but we're not gonna cover matrix multiplication. And we're also, um, we could check to see if, you know, the elements of vector A are contained in B. That's fine. I just thought I'd put it there because it is a logical operator in R. All right, so let's take VEC3. You can name these things anything you want. I just named it VEC3. You can call it B. You can call it your name. Um, doesn't matter. You can call it whatever you want in your R console. And if I do the logical operator VEC3, equals equals 10. It's going to check each element of VEC3 to see if it's 10. And it's saying, yes, the first element of VEC3 is 10, but the last three are not 10. So it just checks for you. All right. Um, okay. So we can combine these. Okay, so what's this line of code going to do? This one says check for VEC3 elements that are greater than 15 or VEC3 the element is 10. And so it's going to find true for the first one because it's equal to 10. True for the second element, 20 is greater than 15. False for the third element because that's not greater than 15 and it's not equal to 10. And true for the last element because it's greater than 15. So you can combine these and you will be combining these in your first assignment, you name it. So we can check out that um, is contained in. So is VEC4, can, did I not define VEC4? Oh, I didn't. Excuse me, I skipped a line. So we gotta define VEC4. So um, I'm glad I'm getting these errors. I get these all the time in my research. Um, you just have to read what the error is and see what you did. So it says object VEC4 not found. That should seem pretty obvious. I didn't define VEC4. So I'm going to go ahead and put VEC4 in here, just copying and pasting. And then I am going to do this next line. So I'm going to ask it, is VEC3 or the elements inside VEC4? And so for VEC3, it had four elements, right? It had 10, 20, 5, and 17. And it's telling me that 10, 20, 5, and 17 are all inside of VEC4. So true, 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 true. And I could do the reverse. I could say, are the elements of VEC4 inside of VEC3? And now I get a longer list of trues and falses because why? Because VEC4 has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight entries. So it said, okay, the first entry of VEC4 5 is in VEC3, the second entry of VEC4 is in VEC3, etc. etc. All right. Now the if else function works just like the if function in Excel. So if you're familiar with Excel, which hopefully you all are, and if not, I will help you. No worries. I've got some tricks for you. Um, the if else function takes as arguments the first, it takes three arguments. The first one is check to see if this is true. The second argument says if it's true, do this. And the third argument says if it's not true, do this. So I'm telling it to check VEC3 to see if the element equals 10. And if it does, print a 10, otherwise print a zero. And so if I hit enter, you can see it did exactly that. The first element of VEC3 was a 10, and so it printed a 10. The second element of VEC3 is a zero, uh, is 20. So it's not a 10, so it printed zero, and it did that for the last two. The which function is also helpful. 
it says which elements of that three are equal to 10. And it's telling me just the first one. Now that might seem a little trivial, but that really helps us when we're trying to check for things inside of other functions. It can return a list of the, like the row number, for instance. All right, let's see. Okay, this one you're gonna have to use in your R homework, so let's go over it. So let's define our vector five. And we'll check the length. Oops. It's got four elements in it, because remember it counts that NA too. But let's say that we want to not include the NAs. We can use the is.na function. So this is another thing that it's checking for elements. So it's asking, can you check every element of vector 5 to tell me if there's an NA in it? So let's run this line of code. And it's telling me the first element of vector 5 is not an NA. The second one's not an NA. The third one's not an NA. But the fourth one is an NA. Okay, so I can also sum up because the falses and trues in R, just like they are in Excel, I don't know if you are aware of this, but you can put a zero or a one in instead of false or true in almost every function in Excel also. And it will add them up for you. So I can wrap the previous line of code in the sum function. I'm taking the previous line is dot na vec5 and I'm just saying sum up those values. So I'm telling it to sum up false, 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 true and it should give me one. And it does because the trues are one and the three falses are zeros. All right. <clears throat> and so if I want to get not equal to an na, then I can run this little line of code. So let's take this apart, let's dissect this. So let's see if we can run just not is.na vec5. So this is the opposite, right? So I'm asking it to check where it is not equal to an na. So the first three were values, so it's saying true, and the last one is false because that's an na. So that little exclamation point is not. So it's saying check vec five for the elements that are not an NA. And this is actually the subset symbol, but I'll go ahead and introduce it now. Okay, so if I wanted to get the length of the vector that's not an NA, I could either sum up this code here. I'm going to up arrow to pull up my previous line, and then I'm going to wrap it in the sum function, and it tells me three. And another way to do that is to use this subset language. And that's to use the length function. And I want to get the length of vec5, and then these square brackets say such that. So we'll revisit that when we get to working with data and subsetting. But for now, just know that you can also use this line of code. Whoops. Shoot. There we go. And it does the same thing as the previous line. So it's saying give me the length of VEC5 such that it's not an NA. All right. Now, perhaps I should have called these tips on the help files um, notes because they're not just extra tips. You need to study these too. These are all very important, helpful hints for you. So notice that you always have to start objects' names with a letter in R. R will not allow an object name to start with a number. So I can't call something one vec. It's going to give me an error. It's saying an unexpected symbol in one vec, which is your name. So again, it tells you where the error occurred. R is case sensitive. Objects need to be referred to with the exact spelling. If you get a plus sign instead of the command prompt after hitting enter, you haven't close out a quote, bracket, parentheses, or something else. So what do you do in that case? So let's call something um, B is concatenate, one, two, three. And let's just say I hit enter. Notice that I didn't get the command prompt. I got the plus sign. And why is that? Because I left off 
my end parenthesis. Now it's still waiting for me to close out that line. So I can just put the parenthesis on this line and hit enter. And now it knows what B is. As long as you get the command prompt, it's going to take everything on those previous lines and combine them into one command. Anything that starts with a command prompt and if the next lines are pluses, it's going to consider all of those one command. All right, this one I've already showed you, but this up and down arrows to edit code, it's going to be a lifesaver for you so you don't have to type in things. Just use the up arrow and the down arrow to scroll up and down through your lines of code. Um, edit that way. I like to teach efficiency. I like to be efficient myself. So hopefully that will help you. And it's not recommended to copy and paste code from Word because Word will change characters like quotation marks and you'll be using quotation marks in your code, um, especially when you do your data, data viz project one. So if you are keeping track of your code with your teammates on a Word document and then you try to copy and paste it into R, you're probably going to get error messages and not they're not going to make any sense to you. So always remember to um, maybe keep your code in a script file. All right, so I'm going to quick show you how to keep your code in a script file so that you can share it. So on my R console up here, I've got a file button. On the Macs, you have one too. You might just need to bump your cursor up to the top to display it. And I'm going to do file new script. And on a Mac, you want to choose file new document. When I open this up, I get what's called a script editor. So I'm just going to move this, resize it, and put it here. And I'm going to show you what this does. So let's take, um, let's just put some things down here. Let's call a um, concatenate one, two, three. And then I'm going to type mean of A. And on a Windows machine, you can just put the cursor on that line and hit Control um, R. And on a Mac, you can put your cursor on that line and do Control Return or Control Enter. And what that does is it takes what you have over here in the editor window and notice that it ran it over here in the GUI. Okay. Now. Let me see if I can make these things squeeze down so tight here. Okay, now watch what happens when I put my cursor over here on the second line in the script editor where I'm taking the mean of the vector A. Notice when I do control R, it's gonna run it over here in the console, so watch. And I can have that cursor anywhere on the line. I can have it on the end of the line too. Hit control R and it runs it for me. So if you keep your code over here in a script editor, then when you before you close out R, you can um, save it. So as long as you're clicked in the script editor, you can do save as and store that file anywhere that you want. I'll put mine on my desktop and call it test.r and save. And now I'm going to show you how to close out R. So you've saved your script editor. You're going to close that out. You can close out the big X. Don't ever save the workspace image. That only saves your objects, okay? Um, you want to say no to this every time, otherwise it's going to clutter up your memory. And before I close this out, I want to tell you one more thing. To check what objects you have in R that you saved, you can always use the objects command. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close this out. I'm not going to save the workspace image because I have all my code. I can recreate everything as long as I've done it in the script editor and close it out. And then, the next time I open R, resize this, the next time that you open R, you can, gosh, that took a long time, you can open up your script by choosing File Open Script. On a Mac, it'll be File Open Document. Navigate to the place on your computer that you put it. And it'll open it up for you. So that's a great way to save your commands. I would highly recommend using a script file. All right, well, that's it for this video. Stay tuned for the next video.